In the original Star Wars trilogy, the one respect in which the droid character C-3PO consistently stands out is that he provides comedy relief. <laughs> what? <laughs> Listen to them, they're dying, R2. Curse my metal body, I wasn't fast enough, it's all my fault. But in rewatching the trilogy recently, I kept noticing interesting things about C-3PO that I hadn't picked up on previously, or I had noticed them, but I hadn't given them a second thought. There's so much entertaining stuff going on with the action-orientated heroes and villains that the timid C-3PO is overshadowed in most of his scenes, even though his shiny gold appearance makes him stand out visually probably more than any other character. So I went through all the scenes again, and the amount of fascinating subtleties, contradictions and eccentricities of this character went way deeper than I expected. He's a robot, yet he seems to be more emotional than any of the human characters. You must repair him. Sir, if any of my circuits or gears will help, I'll gladly donate them. He'll be all right. He acts timid most of the time, and yet he sometimes bullies R2-D2. Go that way. You'll be malfunctioning within a day, you nearsighted scrap pile. Of all the rebel characters, he's the only one who tries to persuade the others to surrender to the Empire. Surrender is a perfectly acceptable alternative in extreme circumstances. The Empire may be gracious with all. And very interesting as to sometimes he is kept in the dark about tactical plans that the other central characters have decided upon, and yet he is used as a pawn within those plans. I present to you a gift. These two droids. This can't be. Artu, you're playing the wrong message. And there are all kinds of other subtleties in his mannerisms, dialogue and physical design. C-3PO is a lot more than just a comedy relief character. Now, usually my way of presenting a character breakdown involves editing back and forth across the movie timeline, while pointing out uh, certain patterns in behaviour, but being this study will be spanning C-3PO scenes across the entire original Star Wars trilogy, I think a looser approach of commenting on his journey in a roughly chronological manner is the way to go. We'll be going over everything, including his important relationships with Luke Skywalker in the first film and Han Solo in the second film, his two-faced relationship with R2-D2, his strange role in the rescue of Han Solo in Return of the Jedi, his physical design, vocal patterns, and we'll be giving special attention to his intricate personality and ideology. But before we get into all that, let me just say that this video isn't about so-called Star Wars lore. L-O-R-E, not L-A-W, because law is not law. C-3PO achieved his impression on movie culture primarily by the original movie trilogy, not by the spin-off books and comics or the prequel and sequel movies that all came out decades later. What I'm more interested in here is unravelling the symbolic nature of the character, what he represents in the original trilogy context. This is going to be a long video as well because my brand of film analysis isn't about oversimplification. Here we delve deep into the psychological intricacies for those who are into that sort of thing and 3PO is a very complex character. With all that in mind, let's follow 3PO's journey throughout this trilogy starting with his debut scene. C-3PO's very first screen moment occurs in the very first interior scene of the very first Star Wars movie, casting he and R2-D2 as the protagonists. The rebel ship is rocked by an explosion and we cut to the droids being shaken to the point of 3PO near losing his balance. Quite appropriate really being that he is emotionally unbalanced for the entire trilogy. They then have their first lines of dialogue of the movie, with C-3PO's lines being the only ones that we can understand. Did you hear that? They shut down the main reactor. It will be destroyed for sure. Now, a ton of information is communicated about the character in these first few shots, especially by his physical design and his vocal mannerisms. In fact, 3PO being the English-speaking character among the two droids effectively makes him the protagonist of the movie for the first 20-odd minutes, at which point Luke is introduced and becomes the new central protagonist. So, probably a good half of this entire video will be about the first 20 minutes of the first Star Wars movie, because this is where C-3PO gets full attention before becoming a background character, although still a complex and important one. In his first shot, a third droid in the background is a lighter tone, and so C-3PO's dazzling gold frame against the white set gives him a strong immediate visual impact. But also it singles him out as a unique individual, 
he isn't a carbon copy of the closely modelled droid behind him. Now, this may seem unimportant, but the filmmakers went to the effort of producing the lighter coloured droid suit and finding a suitable thin actor to fit in. It's possible that the lighter suit was initially intended as being for the C-3PO character, but then another was produced that would have a more colourful impact. Whatever the explanation though, the on-screen result is the same. 3PO's rich colour and shininess marks him out for audience attention, but also it will frequently mark him out visually in battle scenes. He can't fight, and he's visually prominent, so he may as well have a target drawn on his chest. He also has a silver leg, which has been theorised on by fans, but I think the important point is that the silver leg is individual to him, virtually guaranteeing that C-3PO has a unique appearance which no other similar model droid has. In The Empire Strikes Back, the silver droid, or one identical to it, makes an appearance in the Cloud City location. It answers in a gruff robotic voice, and 3PO's response reveals that, although they may look alike, they are worlds apart in terms of personality. Oh, nice to see a familiar face. It should be. How rude. So, 3PO is unique among robots, casting him as an individual. At various points in the trilogy, other humanoid robots will be seen, and they're virtually always extremely different to C-3PO in terms of what kind of personality is suggested in their physical designs. And we'll come to those examples later. And we get the same individuality with R2-D2 throughout the trilogy. He is uniquely distinguishable in appearance compared to other small cylindrical droids. Plot-wise, the most plausible interpretation I've come across regarding 3PO's silver leg, and which I think is implied by the scene in itself anyway, is that at some point his original leg was damaged and had to be replaced, but only a silver version of the leg was available. This in turn suggests that 3PO's bright yellow model was a rarity, possibly even one of a kind, hence the lack of an available replacement leg in the same colour. The silver leg also suggests that 3PO is either prone to being physically damaged, or that he has a history of being caught up in dangerous situations. So it's a battle scar, if you will. Actually, the slightly dirty and scratched appearance of the two droids in close-up suggests that they've both been through a lot, although some reports say that this uh, scratched and dirty appearance was done because 3PO was too shiny on set, and so they were dirtied up for that reason. But the battle scar's implication is still there, and it adds to the characters. Also evident here is that even though there's a very similar modelled droid behind 3PO, his own robot species so to speak, 3PO identifies much more strongly with his buddy R2-D2, and the friendship is reciprocated. For two robots so different in design to be best friends suggests personal autonomy on both their parts. These aren't just programmed artificial intelligence entities, they have their own motives, and especially to have the choice to form relationships of their own choosing. As for the lighter coloured droid, it says nothing, and it wanders off in its own direction, clearly driven by a different motivation to see 3 po So what about 3 po's dialogue? He doesn't speak in the standard cold mathematical logic of typical sci-fi robots. He speaks emotional statements that could just as easily be attributed to an organic human character, and his vocal style is full of emotional punctuation. They shut down the main reactor. It will be destroyed for sure. This is madness. They're heading in this direction. What are we going to do? We'll be sent to the spice mines of Kessel or smashed into who knows what. So I think a basic starting point in understanding C-3PO is that symbolically he is essentially a human character hidden beneath a robot appearance. In fact, R2-D2 and C-3PO aren't even called robots by the human characters. They're called droids an unusual label which in itself casts them in a slightly different mould to what we generally think of as robots. Now some of you may jump to conclude that 3PO is programmed with human emotions to make him relatable to the humans he serves, but as we'll discover along his journey, the intensity and type of emotions he has actually interferes with his ability to perform functions in the service of humans. Instead, we'll discover that 3PO's emotions serve other psychological functions on a symbolic level rather than in the realm of plot points. Although 3PO has no moving facial features, the strong emotional manner of his speech suggests a character who feels rather than just thinks, but also the design of his face appears to be expressive in itself, a permanent expression of shock, fear, or even terror, fitting with the fearful statements he has already made in his dialogue. And a great deal more is suggested in his physical design, 
A number of details instantly indicate that 3PO is not designed for any specific kinds of physical interaction with the world. He's skinny, suggesting he lacks the kind of industrial physical strength that we usually get from androids in sci-fi movies. The limited movement of his legs, the lack of dexterity in the hands, and the bars that rigidly hold his elbows in a locked position where they can never hang down in a relaxed and loose manner. His arms are fixed in a sort of defensive position. Imagine how different 3PO would seem if he could let his limbs hang down loosely. Both in movies and popular culture, there's a fairly consistent pattern regarding how we perceive the stiffness of limbs. Action movies tend to involve a lot of over-the-top acrobatics and flexibility of limbs. Music culture is the same, especially when it comes to rap and hip-hop, in which arms and wrists get loosely flailed about like elephant trunks. Imagine the comedy value if C-3PO tried to take part in a rap battle or an acrobatics contest. It's obvious that 3PO isn't designed for running, climbing or lifting heavy objects. And he definitely isn't designed for fighting. Never in the trilogy does C-3PO engage in physical combat with the enemy. We'll learn later that there is sort of a plot point basis for his inflexibility and largely useless physical design. But for now, those design features suggest a timid, passive personality. And there are even more features that fit with his tendency toward the emotions of fear and anxiety. His wiry guts are out on open display, but everything else is solid framed. Our guts tend to be an emotional center point for feelings of anxiety, so the lack of protection for 3PO in this area makes him appear vulnerable in the physical and emotional sense. This is even joked upon in a later scene. Help! I think I'm melting! This is all your fault! The exposed wiring area certainly isn't for flexibility because during the entire trilogy, 3PO never displays the ability to bend down and pick something up off the floor. In fact, I don't think we ever see him being able to sit down or stand up on his own. We might see him sitting down or standing up, but we don't see him making the transition between the two. Uh, not once that I can recall. There's also a disc feature placed just above the exposed stomach wiring, which looks as if it houses a core component of his mechanism, perhaps a fuel cell of some kind. Human beings have a heart as their bodily centre, if you will, but the human heart is high up in the chest. So I think 3PO's physical and emotional core being low down near the gut, like a pot belly, further indicates that fear and anxiety are his default emotional states. If that disc had been placed high up on his chest, it would make him look more masculine and confident. There are bolts on the side of 3PO's neck, maybe they're intended to be a parallel with the neck bolts of Frankenstein's monster, although I don't see hardly any other parallels with that creature. In a more basic sense, the neck bolts add to the fixed physical rigidity of the character. 3PO can only turn his head in a very small amount in any given direction, up, down, left, right, so he has to typically tilt or turn his body to significantly change his angle of view. This is made clear in the moment he first appears on screen. So even though we learn later that 3PO is a droid designed primarily for verbal communication, his head movements are stiff. Wouldn't it make sense to have an exposed wiry neck area to allow fluid movements such as head nods or the ability to meet other people's gaze more easily? Makes no practical sense, does it? So I think 3PO's overall physical rigidity is reflective of his perceptual and emotional rigidity. His preoccupation with negative emotions such as pessimism, fear, anxiety and defeatism are established in these first lines of dialogue. They shut down the main reactor. We'll be destroyed for sure. What are we going to do? We'll be sent to the spice mines of Kessel or smashed into who knows what. And those emotional tendencies will be consistent to almost every appearance he makes in the whole trilogy. And the last physical detail before we move on, his large internally lit eyes. Full whites of the eyes exposed, or full lights of the eyes. They make him look like he's in a permanent state of emotional shock, which is added to by the slightly agape mouth. And the vertical lines within the eyes furthers the notion of eyes stretched wide open. Horizontal lines would lessen that impression. R2-D2's large round eye makes him look alive and emotionally awake too. But with 3PO, the eyes being lit up especially suggests that he is alive inside. I think that was important given his dazzling shiny gold frame. In fact, his eyes make him look childlike as well. And keep that child concept in mind because we will be returning to it later.
In terms of motivations, 3PO's opening dialogue lines are not what we would expect from an artificial intelligence character. They shut down the main reactor. We'll be destroyed for sure. This is madness. What are we going to do? We'll be sent to the spice mines of Kessel or smashed into who knows what. He isn't preoccupied with any particular programmed duties. He's motivated by survival, self-preservation and self-interest. So from the outset, 3PO doesn't come across as a programmed character. I mean, what would be the point of infusing him with paralyzing emotional anxieties? 3PO is essentially a symbolic human disguised as a robot. The overall existential predicament of the droids, and 3PO in particular, is comically depicted in this follow-up scene after their introduction. Part of a war that 3PO doesn't want to be involved in, the droids are caught up in crossfire between the opposing forces. <laughs> in fact, he almost gets blasted right in the arse. R2 now seems to sneak off where he gets given the Death Star blueprints by Princess Leia and is instructed to escape in a pod and deliver the plans to Ben Kenobi. Come on R2, get your third leg out. Uh, this is the first in a pattern of instances in which 3PO is not made privy to the tactical plans of even his closest rebel friends, and we'll get into the reasons why later. We also get a clear deviation here between the two droids that will remain consistent. R2 has a can-do attitude of seeking out and implementing solutions, but 3PO preoccupies himself with negative outcomes. Perhaps the fact that Leia entrusted the plans to R2 and not to 3PO is reflective of their personality traits. I mean, she sees 3PO here, but she doesn't tell him anything. Next up, 3PO engages in more negativity. Hey, you're not permitted in there. It's restricted. You'll be deactivated for sure. So he's afraid of being deactivated, in other words, killed, by the Empire, and he's afraid of the same under the Rebels just for breaking a minor protocol rule. He has a generalised fear of perceived authority. As with any artificial intelligence character, the questions arise as to how much of 3PO's thought patterns are just programming, and how much of it is his personal choice. If he and R2 were programmed to follow official rules, such as no droid shall enter into an escape pod, then they simply would not be able to carry out the act. Remember when Robocop tried to go against a programmed directive? Ace, I'll make an exception. You are under arrest. That's how robots typically respond in movies when they're given a, an order that conflicts with the programming. Well, we get none of that with either of these droids. They are aware of directives and protocol, but they decide for themselves whether to obey or not. Hence, they both do the forbidden and get into the pod. R2 motivated by his mission and 3PO motivated by self-preservation. R2 even mocks 3PO's sighting of protocol as a weak intellectual choice rather than a programmed response. And the ability of these droids to insult each other and feel insulted is also characteristic of an organic mind. Don't you call me a mindless philosopher, you overweight glob of grease? Now come on before somebody sees you. R2 seems to understand 3PO's pessimistic attitude quite well. Calling him a mindless philosopher is contradictory because you need to have a mind in order to philosophize. But I think what R2 is getting at, and this seems to be an important part of the movie's ideology, is that if you use your intelligence to make excuses for pessimism and inaction, then you may as well not have a mind. The point of having a mind is that you use it to solve problems. Before they get in, R2 makes an effort to telling 3PO that they are on a mission to deliver Death Star plans, but given the urgency of the situation, he can't fully explain. Secret mission? What plans? What are you talking about? I'm not getting in there. A curious aspect of this, uh, which is consistent in C-3PO's behaviour in following scenes, is that he dismisses R2's statements about a mission because he doesn't want to hear about it. He doesn't want the responsibility of making an effort to help the rebel cause. On the journey down to the planet's surface, 3PO could ask R2 to fully explain the mission, but he doesn't ask because he has a psychological tendency toward denial, which is extremely common among organic humans anyway. So in they go, but of course 3PO has to blurt out one last pessimistic statement. I'm going to regret this. Talking out loud to himself is a very human trait, and the concept of regret, that's something a computer shouldn't be able to experience. 
Now, you may think I'm nitpicking a little bit regarding all these humanistic traits in C-3PO, but something about the Star Wars trilogy is that, unlike a lot of other futuristic science fiction, there is very little in the way of artificial intelligence. There's lots of droids, but aside from these two characters, the droids are all basically very mechanical, machine-like, lacking in personality, and the organic human element is very strong in these films. So it's only these two characters who are like this. Down to the surface, and they're out onto the sand dunes. The landscapes are just desert and mountain locations filmed on Earth, and so the droids stand out as the high-technology element. It may seem like a non-point, but I mention it because if they had just been humans, then these scenes wouldn't be especially interesting in the classic science fiction sense. At this point, I think it's appropriate to bring up a historical film parallel which has been widely cited as the key inspiration for these droid characters. Apparently, they were inspired by a pair of low-level peasant protagonists in Kurosawa's 1958 movie Hidden Fortress, which is set in medieval Japan. And it's not the only strong parallel between the two movies. I noticed lots more. The warrior characters in Hidden Fortress are sword-wielding samurai, in parallel with the lightsaber-wielding Jedis of Star Wars. Darth Vader's helmet design has been widely cited as being inspired by samurai Kabuto helmets. And both movies include a young, intelligent, brave and morally pure princess character who leads others against tyranny. Hidden Fortress is superb, by the way, so I do recommend you get a copy and give it a watch. The reason I mention the Hidden Fortress inspiration is that I suspect this is part of why C-3PO comes off as though he was originally written as a human. Droids in Star Wars are lower class creatures, peasants if you will. The peasants in Hidden Fortress live in constant fear and are very low in intelligence. I wouldn't say 3PO is low in intelligence, but his intelligence is stifled by his permanent state of anxiety. Another important point is that the peasants in Hidden Fortress are morally repugnant. At one point, the princess character is asleep and the two peasants discuss whether to take the opportunity to rape her. But the droid protagonists of Star Wars, they're not like that. Well, for one thing, they have no genitals unless you want to get Freudian about R2-D2's third leg representing the occasional stiffy. That isn't very reassuring. In terms of morality, R2 is totally different to the peasants of Hidden Fortress because he is committed to the rebel cause and he has courage. But C-3PO's morality is open to question at many points in the trilogy, and this scene is one of them. He starts off by stating that he and R2-D2 can experience pain, and he refers to their mutual existence as life. We seem to be made to suffer. It's our lot in life. And he's got the melodramatic negativity to boot. I've got to rest before I fall apart. My joints are almost frozen. What a desolate place this is. They have a little argument about which way to go, and 3PO's choice is based upon what he considers to be the easy option in the short term, fitting with his general philosophy. Where do you think you're going? Well, I'm not going that way. It's much too rocky. This way is much easier. What makes you think there are settlements over there? Don't get technical with me. Don't get technical with me. What a funny term for a robot to use. Mission. What are you talking about? I've just about had enough of you. And again, he doesn't want to hear about Artu's mission because his priority is self-preservation, avoidance of danger, quite like the peasants in Hidden Fortress. Yet at the same time, 3PO shows a nasty streak. He has a little tantrum, even resorting to violence within the limits of his physical rigidity. Go that way. You'll be malfunctioning within a day, you near-sighted scrap pile. And don't let me catch you following me, begging for help, because you won't get it. So in this private moment between the droids, 3PO reveals that beneath his intelligence there's immaturity, and beneath his general state of anxiety he harbours feelings of anger and aggression, and he can be emotionally manipulative. This is important because such moments contradict his whimpering deference in the presence of human authority figures, suggesting he even puts on some of the deference in order to win favour. And that's kind of lame, isn't it? In his last lines of dialogue here, 3PO outright rejects the motivational premise of the movie itself. No more adventures. I'm not going that way. He's not a risk taker, is he? A couple of thoughts now on 3PO's voice before we get to new scenes. 
First of all, a loving shout out to actor Anthony Daniels who played 3PO physically and voice acted him. We may not get to see any facial acting from Daniels, but he makes excellent use of jittery physical movements and vocal nuances to give life to the character. Superb job. 3PO has a classic southern English accent, but a much gentler tone than other English accented characters in the trilogy, such as Ben Kenobi, Governor Tarkin, Darth Vader, and especially the Emperor, who has a deliciously dark English accent. In time you will call me Master. In fact, most of the Empire's top brass seem to have English accents. It's funny that the classic upper-class English accent associated with snobbery, as opposed to other English accents such as mine, Liverpudlian. That snobbish accent can be used in movies to convey a character as either evil and threatening, philosophically sophisticated, or as a spineless weakling. So weird that that accent covers so many different uh, character types. Obviously, C-3PO fits the uh, spineless weakling uh, interpretation of that accent. His vocal tone is so gentle, it's almost prepubescent. And that brings me to another significant aspect of his overall character. C-3PO is asexual. He has no genitals, just as children's dolls and action figures have none. We could say that 3PO has no balls, (laughs) as in no courage. But at the same time, along with his limited ability to physically manoeuvre in the world... 3PO's asexuality contributes to the aura of him being a helpless, innocent child, trapped in an adult body and yet tasked with adult verbal communication functions that he isn't emotionally equipped to deal with. I have noticed when viewing this movie with young children that, much like the Ewoks in Return of the Jedi, kids seem to strongly identify with these droid protagonists. Possibly this is because of the toddler-like limitations in their physical movement, R2-D2 is kind of like a crawling baby with a big round head and he communicates in expressive gobbledygook sounds like babies do. Toddlers love their flashing bleepy toys as well, so perhaps young kids relate to R2 on that level as well. C-3PO is like an older brother in the learning to walk toddler stage. And these symbolic child factors are important because there are no actual child characters in the original Star Wars trilogy although Luke Skywalker kind of doubles up as a young boy. And I think that, as well as connecting emotionally with child viewers, these droids invite a parental empathy from adult viewers. The Jawas and some of the smaller aliens in other scenes, uh, they seem to also serve as characters who child viewers can relate to. These various small characters may be somewhat ugly at times, but they're kind of lovable and cute as well. They are the children of the story, just like the Ewoks in the third film. In 3PO's case, the childlike anxiety and desire for the physical protection offered by parent figures like Luke Skywalker and Han Solo, this generates a great deal of audience sympathy. At last, Master Luke's come to rescue me. We're coming! Back to the first Star Wars movie. We have 3PO wandering the desert as the sole protagonist. He talks to himself out loud, as a human would do. 3PO's statements are revealing here because he isn't putting on an act for any external observer. Particularly, he shows signs of paranoid distrust, even of his closest friend, a vindictive desire for others to experience misfortune, and he refuses to take responsibility for the consequences of his own actions. That malfunctioning little twerp, this is all his fault. He tricked me into going this way, but he'll do no better. In his next scene, 3PO is inside the Jawa truck, but the scene begins with a different droid character. Like the background droid in 3PO's first appearance, this one is silver, but it has a hostile-looking insectoid face and a voice that is robotic in tone and alien in dialect. If it's supposed to be a protocol droid like C-3PO, then its face and voice aren't suitable for that function. This droid gets several close-up shots, lasting a total of about 8 seconds, unusual for a random extra. And I think his presence here achieves two basic functions in relation to the main droids. He appears slightly threatening, or at the very least, unrelatable. This makes 3PO and R2 being glad to find each other again more emotionally plausible. R2-D2, it is you, it is you! 
and the behavior of this robot and the other ones in the scene comes across as much more mechanical, which makes R2 and 3PO seem more alive by comparison. Note that the one in the foreground here seems like a creepy clockwork doll. 3PO physically bumps into a broken down dead version of that same droid in Return of the Jedi. R2, don't leave me! <sighs> Another droid here, commonly referred to as R5-D4, is very similar to R2, but its red coloration, its more rigidly shaped head, and its lack of an innocent looking large round eye make it look less alive and possibly even sinister in motive. It seems to look in R2's direction, but neither of these cylindrical droids make an attempt to communicate with each other. So, you see how we have R2-D2 and C-3PO, both of them are paralleled by other droids in this scene who seem to be impersonal and lacking in emotion. They, they lack the life that the main two droids have. By the way, later on, an Empire droid will appear as a menacing but faceless black ball with no indications of having its own personality. In another scene on the Death Star, there's a small droid that appears to be the equivalent of a mouse or rat and is shown as having a mind of its own rather than serving a function for the Empire, but it's an extremely basic droid. And here is a droid that appears to be identical to the insectoid one in the Jawa truck, but this time it looks even more insectoid because it's black with silver bulbous eyes. Might be the same costume repainted. And Chewbacca looks about ready to sniff its ass there too. <laughs> Sorry, I had to get that one in, it just found it funny. The point I'm making is that it's fairly consistent that only R2 and 3PO are humanized robots in this trilogy. As for the other R2 unit droids, they just sound like walking ghetto blasters. Back to the Jawa truck interior. For the briefest moment here, 3PO is shown with his eye lights turned off as if he was asleep like a person. He forgets his grudge and is glad to see R2, even placing a hand affectionately on his head. Physical affection between robots. Again, these are just human minds hidden under robotic appearance. Next morning, the most observant stormtrooper ever discovers one of the robots took a dump in the desert Look, sir, droids. And then back to the Jawa truck where 3PO turns nasty again. Wake up! Wake up! And then switches back to pessimistic negativity. We're doomed. Do you think they'll melt us down? Don't shoot, don't shoot. Will this never end? Ha! Will this never end? His trilogy journey has only just started and a hell of a lot is going to happen to him throughout these three films. We can see here as well that the fixed position of his arms is ideal for surrendering to any given enemy. It kind of fits with his nature, doesn't it? His uh, submissive nature. Getting all the droids lined up for the sales pitch, it's clear that most of them are the equivalent of mobile kitchen appliances or washing machines. This one looks like a clothes hanger. They're very impersonal in design, but they are shown to have a small amount of motivation in their defiance of instructions about where to move. They're almost like babies crawling about. Again, good stuff for kids. 3PO puts a lot of effort into kissing Luke's uncle's ass, begging to be purchased, and an important pattern of communication is set in motion here that will resurface in many other scenes, especially in Empire Strikes Back. 3PO is so groveling that he annoys his human counterparts and is told to shut up on account of it. Can you speak Bocce? Of course I can, sir. It's like a second language to me. I'm a yeah, All right, shut up. I'll take this. Even R2 here slowly looks as if disapproving of 3PO's desperate waffling. As Ferris Bueller once said, you can't respect someone who kisses your ass. So we learn here that 3PO is a protocol droid who speaks six million languages, or at least he claims he does. 
Protocol basically refers to bureaucratic communication, governmental rules, institutional procedures, that realm of communication, which tends to involve a lot of conformist attitudes, distortive language, subtle gestures of submission or domination, and lots of doublespeak. Combined with his multilingual abilities, it seems that 3PO's default job is to be a kind of messenger between different bureaucracies, and this appears to explain some of his behaviour, his sitting-on-the-fence attitude of not being committed to any particular cause, even the rebel cause. And that would be a strength in situations of translation, diplomacy and mediation. You want to be seen as neutral. But it also makes him a talker, not a doer. He typically inhabits environments in which speaking and listening are like treading on eggshells. A wrong gesture or a poorly chosen phrase during power diplomacy can trigger a catastrophic turn of events. And so, like many politicians and PR types, 3PO shrouds his communication beneath a veer of excessive politeness, desperately trying not to offend anyone. But referring to himself as programmed raises a question. How much of 3PO's emotions and personal philosophy were chosen for him by his programmers and how much of it is how he has personally evolved in response to experience? One of his statements suggests he's been around quite a bit. Sir, my first job was programming binary load lifters, very similar to your evaporators in most respects. Can you speak, Bachi? But as will become more evident the further we get into his journey, the question of programmed versus nurtured is a distracting question. What 3PO represents in terms of the philosophy of the trilogy is far more important. So, getting on with the scene, R2 doesn't get picked, R5-D4 gets picked instead. And by the way, note the difference in the names. R2-D2, it rolls off the tongue easier than R5-D4. And the words R2-D2, that's something that toddlers could say much easier. R2-D2, you know? The lower numbers in R2's name also suggest a more baseline, relatable simplicity. As for 3PO, the number in his name is only one higher than R2. I mean, 6PO or 8PO would sound very different. And here's something more on those numbers that I think is incidental, but it's worth considering. Remember I mentioned that these two droids are highly relatable for young children because of their baby and toddler-like physical lack of agility? Well, maybe the numbers in their names are reflective of that. R2-D2 and 3PO as equivalent to them being two and three year olds. Yes, I know that's a stretch of interpretation and probably wasn't intended, but you never know. So it's a very interesting idea. Here we get another instance of 3PO's two-faced nature. He is initially going to abandon R2 in order to join the safety of Luke and his family. He makes no attempt to persuade Luke or his uncle to choose R2 until the other droid pops. So if that other droid hadn't popped, 3PO would have willingly abandoned his supposed best buddy ever? Not exactly respectable, is it? So 3PO can be supportive and helping, or he can be unreliable, even traitorous, depending on the circumstances. His number one priority so far is himself. And note how he helps R2, but then ruins the gesture by over-dramatizing what he did and trying to use it to manipulate R2. Now don't you forget this. Why I should stick my neck out for you is quite beyond my capacity. Now we get a few scenes roughly introducing Luke's dilemma. His desire for adventure, wanting to become a pilot for the rebels, but being stuck with boring farm chores. He becomes the main character, but 3PO remains a central element and his role in the story begins to change. He reacts to having a bath like an organic creature would. Thank the maker. This oil bath is going to feel so good. It seems he can feel physical pleasure across his bodily frame, and given his tendency toward anxiety, he can feel physical pain like any human can. He also said, thank the maker. Thank the maker. This oil bath is going to feel so good. His equivalent of thank God, a suggestion that he has spiritual beliefs of some kind. His tendency to suck up to authority with phony gestures really comes to the forefront here. Oh, big this ride. I'm never going to get out of here. Is there anything I might do to help? No. Oh. 3PO knows he can't do anything about Luke's situation, and then he says as much. You have to harvest or teleport me off this rock. I don't think so, sir. I'm only a droid and not very knowledgeable about such things. So the offer of help was a fake gesture. 
Like an obedient butler, he calls Luke Sir, as if Luke's a snobby member of the knighthood orders. I see, sir. No. You can call me Luke. I see, sir Luke. <laughs> no, just Luke. Now, funnily enough, Ben Kenobi actor Alec Guinness had been knighted in 1959 and became Sir Alec Guinness. 3PO describes himself here in vague technical terms. And I am C-3PO, human cyborg relations. That term seems to deliberately cast confusion on exactly what kind of entity 3PO is. A cyborg is a creature that is part man, part machine, but we see no organic features in 3PO. He appears totally robotic at the physical level. So what does he mean, human-cyborg relations? Are there organic elements in his central processing brain structure? I doubt it. In fact, the only sense I can make of his description is on the symbolic level. As I've said several times, 3PO is a human being character disguised narratively as a robot. A robot with a living human soul, if you will. So we could just as well say, I am C-3PO, human soul relations. 3PO lets slip that he and R2 have been involved with the rebel cause against the Empire, but when Luke surprises him by showing enthusiasm for that cause, 3PO makes excuses to drop the subject. What with the rebellion and all? You know of the rebellion against the Empire? Actually, there's not much to tell. I'm not much more than an interpreter, and not very good at telling stories. He doesn't really believe in the rebel cause, and certainly doesn't want to rejoin it. This marks the beginning of a symbolic shift in C-3PO. Luke wants to join the rebel cause, or at least consciously he does, and to take the battle to the enemy. But like any human being, he has in his mind seeds of doubt, fear and pessimism. And 3PO personifies these defeatist traits that Luke must struggle with during his journey. In other words, 3PO becomes a sort of doppelganger, an externalisation of Luke's own fears and weaknesses. And we'll get more into this later. Now 3PO's previous efforts to make himself sound sophisticated so that he would be bought from the Jowers are dropped. I'm not much more than an interpreter and not very good at telling stories. There's an interesting little parallel with the scene in Return of the Jedi here as well. 3PO says he's not very good at telling stories, which is an excuse to avoid getting involved with the rebel cause again. But in Return of the Jedi, he will do a great job of telling the whole saga to the Ewoks, complete with dramatic sound effects. So there's all these little moments of dishonesty from 3PO. Minute verbal distortions of logic typical of a diplomat. By the way, there's something else really funny in this scene too. After the oil bath, 3PO has a tiny rag and he wipes his... <laughs> Sorry, let me say that again. After the oil bath, 3PO has a tiny rag and wipes his crotch. Not at making them interesting anyway. This oil bath is going to feel so good. This oil bath is going to feel so good. Talk about a happy accident. Now R2 shows his intelligence by deliberately playing a small selected clip of Leia's message, just enough to hopefully entice Luke to seek out Ben Kenobi, who the full message is intended for. R2 lies that if his restraining bolt is removed, it might help him unlock and play back the full message. But when the bolt is removed, he pretends he lost the message completely. So R2 basically tricked Luke into removing the restraining bolt so that he could escape and seek out Ben. And knowing that 3PO has no interest in helping him on the mission, R2 kept 3PO in the dark about what he was doing. 3PO may have even deliberately misinterpreted some of R2's dialogue here. For example, he pretends he doesn't know much about Princess Leia. Oh, he says it's nothing, sir. Merely a malfunction, old data. Who is she? She's beautiful. I'm afraid. I'm not quite sure, Help sir. I think she was a passenger on our last voyage. A person of some importance, as I believe. But we know from the opening scenes that he knows exactly who she is. There'll be no escape for the princess this time. In fact, this raises a generalised question of how reliable 3PO's dialogue is when he is interpreting between characters who speak different languages. Clever R2-D2 chose to bypass 3PO's role as interpreter by playing the partial message, which wouldn't need translating for Luke. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. And there's another contradictory slip-up from 3PO here. After all the arse-kissing politeness, 
he physically hits R2 for the second time in the film. You'll be malfunctioning within a day, you near-sighted scrap pile. What message? The one you've just been playing. R2 has no arms and can't hit back, so it's pretty low of 3PO to act like this. And his mind games continue. No, I don't think he likes you at all. No, I don't like you either. Now, this is all tongue-in-cheek, jokey stuff, of course, but it also communicates nuances in 3PO's personality, and his personality is very important in relation to the other central characters. We'll learn more about that as we go on. Later that evening, Luke finds 3PO hiding, petrified that he's going to be deactivated, in other words, killed, on account of R2 escaping. Oh. What are you doing hiding back there? It wasn't my fault, sir. Please don't deactivate me. I told him not to go, but he's... This is the clearest example that 3PO lives in fear of all forms of authority. The way he's acting here suggests that Luke is the equivalent of Darth Vader. 3PO and R2 had previously had a discussion before R2 left. I told him not to go, but he's 40, malfunctioning. Kept babbling on about his mission. And yet 3PO still did not come to understand that mission, or he was simply too cowardly to assist in it. Hiding from perceived danger is 3PO's nature, his default position in almost every situation. R2 had no time for this, so he abandoned 3PO for the larger cause. Talking outside, 3PO makes a statement that subtly hints at something surprising about him, his hidden arrogance. These astro droids are getting quite out of hand. Even I can't understand their logic at times. Even I can't understand their logic at times, implying that 3PO himself has superior logic. An over-reliance on expressed logic is often a cover for fear of emotion. Quite common in academia, actually. And there's another little amusing nuance from 3PO here. Even though they're stood right next to each other and there's no one else to talk to, 3PO taps Luke on the shoulder to ask a question. Pardon me, sir, but wouldn't we go after him? It's too dangerous with all the sand people. I love these little touches. They're not intrusive, but they continuously add to the character. And note also that the bedside lamp is making an escape. Easy to miss is that 3PO is actually driving Luke's land speeder here. The script confirms this, and I think this is the most physically proactive thing that 3PO ever does in the whole trilogy, but it's only shown from a distance. And it doesn't seem to happen again. 3PO doesn't drive the land speeder to Moss Eisley later. Why not? If there is sense to be made of this, I think it's that 3PO wants to find his friend R2-D2 and have him returned to Luke's home, but the trip to Moss Eisley is a mission to rejoin the rebel efforts against the Empire which is something a 3PO doesn't want to do. He literally just goes along for the ride in that instance. Anyway, I jumped ahead a bit there. Let's get back to the chronological breakdown. Catching up with R2, 3PO goes right back into bully mode, as if he thinks this is what Luke wants. Master Luke is your rightful owner now. And don't talk to me of your mission either. You're fortunate he doesn't blast you into a million pieces right here. R2 gets so scared he needs a piss. No, it's all right, but I think we better go. Now, 3PO could have easily been written out of the story around this point, but he will continue to serve important functions, most importantly in terms of symbolism. For one thing, he at least partially represents the negative emotional baggage that adventurers like Luke and the other rebels have to carry about with them in their fight against the Empire. At times, it seems like 3PO is Luke's internal doubts and fears externalised, the pessimistic voice of discouragement and low self-confidence made flesh. Or made metal. R2 detects the presence of the sand people, and 3PO appears even more scared than Luke. What's wrong with them now? There are several creatures approaching from the southeast. Sand people. Worse. Come on, let's go have a look. Well, come on. When the Sandman attacks, 3PO personifies Luke's moment of startled terror. His eyes actually light up to depict the sudden startle of the attack. The filmmakers had even made sure to have his eyelights switched off in the build-up to this moment. And he gives the weirdest of screams, appearing to faint. He's an emotional doppelganger for Luke's fear in the moment. In the aftermath of all this, and the appearance of Ben, Luke initially forgets 3PO even exists and has to be reminded by R2. 3PO... 
So Luke meeting his future mentor, Ben Kenobi, has significantly demoted 3PO's importance in the plot, like he's become a piece of baggage. They find 3PO with an arm somehow severed, but even more strange is 3PO's behaviour. Initially, he seems to have suppressed the trauma of the attack. Where am I? I must have taken a bad step. Luke reminds him of the trauma by mentioning the sand people, and, responding with existential despair, 3PO gives his most defeatist statement yet. Probably his most defeatist statement in the whole trilogy. We've got to get out of here before the sand people return. I don't think I can make it. You go on, Master Luke. There's no sense in you risking yourself on my account. I'm done for. No, you're not. What kind of talk is that? Quickly. 3PO's reduced motivation to live even seems to be faded by his eyes not being lit up. That's a nice subtlety. Another interesting aspect is that this is the first time 3PO has encountered the famous Ben Kenobi, and yet he is indifferent to Ben's presence. He doesn't even ask who this old man is, and Ben himself listens to 3PO with mutual indifference. Remember that 3PO, like Luke's uncle, wants nothing to do with the rebels. To this effect, there will be very little communication between 3PO and Ben in this film. They are ideologically alien to each other. 3PO wants to stay safe in the little isolated hole in the desert that Luke calls home. It's like he is Luke's subconscious fear of venturing out, but Ben wants Luke to join the fight. Fitting with all that, 3PO takes a verbal back seat in the next scene while Ben introduces Luke to the concept of the Force and tries to persuade him to join the Rebellion. 3PO's one line of dialogue speaks volumes here. He listens to Ben talk about Luke's father being a fighter pilot, and right after Ben pulls out a lightsaber and mentions the possibility of Luke pursuing an ideological crusade, 3PO does something I don't recall him doing in any other scene of the trilogy. He asks permission to shut himself down. He feared you might follow old Obi-Wan on some damn fool idealistic crusade like your father did. Sir, if you'll not be needing me, I'll close down for a while. Sure, go ahead. 3PO may have chose to do this because he's still traumatised by the Sandman attack, or it might be because he wants to block out the emerging discussion about pursuing a dangerous mission of joining the Rebellion. He goes into denial. 3PO has Ostrich Syndrome. In terms of symbolism, we could also think of this as Luke's own fears and anxieties taking a backseat as he is introduced to the powerful lightsaber weapon that he will one day wield as a trained Jedi. And wouldn't it be funny, though, if 3PO were awake and panicked as Luke nearly takes his head off? Clumsy or random as a blaster. An elegant weapon. After the introduction to Jedi powers, Luke wakes 3PO back up, and his lack of response to what happens next also speaks volumes. R2 finally plays Leia's full message, revealing the mission and its importance. Now, 3PO has acted confused about R2's mission all along, and now that he is fully privy to it, he says nothing, almost as if it didn't even come as a surprise to him. Of course, Luke and Ben's responses to the information are the important plot points here, but there isn't a single line of acknowledgement from 3PO regarding that mission. We'd expect him to say something like, R2, why didn't you tell me about this? Or, I apologise, Master Luke, I had no idea that there were such matters at stake. An appropriate line of cowardly avoidance could have been added here along the lines of something like, Master Luke, would you like me to stay here and assist your uncle? <laughs> but no, 3PO gives no verbal response at all. Instead, Luke's pessimism is characterised in his own dialogue. I'm not going to Alderaan. I've got to get home. It's late. I'm in for it as it is. I need your help, Luke. I can't get involved. I've got work to do. So 3PO's symbolic role of personifying Luke's anxiety is redundant in this moment. It's not that I like the Empire, I hate it, but there's nothing I can do about it right now. It's all such a long way from here. That's your uncle talking. Ben could have equally said, that's 3PO talking. Moving on to the scene of them discovering the dead Jawas, 3PO is prominently reacting to the carnage as Luke does the same in the distance. Parallel between them. And there's going to be a very similar moment to that later towards the end of the movie. Luke again expresses his own fears in this scene, and so 3PO's role in that respect is redundant, so he remains silent. Oh, and I think this is the only moment in the trilogy that 3PO and R2 are referred to with the word robots. 
If they traced the robots here, they may have learned who they sold them to. Once Luke returns after finding his aunt and uncle dead, the droids say nothing, but their actions are really interesting. 3PO is collecting Jawa corpses and burning them on a fire. A crematorial funeral, basically. So did 3PO choose to carry out this task, out of some spiritual inclination? I think more likely is that Ben ordered him to do it like a good little slave, and Ben isn't even helping in the task. At the same time, R2-D2 is stood next to the fire as if mourning the dead. Unless he's just getting warm, but hey, this is a hot desert and he's a robot. Actually, I think the jaw burning here probably serves as a symbolic funeral in relation to Luke's dead aunt and uncle. They got burned too. But the droid's role in this ritual seems to further the sense that they are living souls themselves, or at least they can relate to spiritual issues. Luke now accepts that he has to join the rebels, and at least at the conscious level he seems committed to the cause. Fear is not an element, and so 3PO is silent in this interaction. But on the way to Mos Eisley, they stop off on a cliff to take a god's eye view of the port. The droids would seem to be irrelevant in this moment, and yet there they are, taking part in the philosopher's contemplation of the adventure ahead. Even in the close dialogue shot, the droids are kept in frame, as if they are doppelgangers of Ben and Luke. But Ben is doing something that 3PO would typically do. He is expressing concern about potential danger. You will never find the more wretched hive of scum and villainy. We must be cautious. And so 3PO is silent again because his role as the expressor of negative emotion on behalf of the organic characters, it's redundant in this moment. You see how there's a pattern emerging in which the anxieties of the central human characters are either expressed in their own dialogue or in the dialogue of 3PO, but virtually never both in the same scene. This is a major factor that led me to conclude that when 3PO is moaning, he personifies the subconscious fears of the human characters. So with that in mind, I think it's worth making a key point about 3PO's core role in the emotional structure of this film. This Star Wars movie, the first of the series, is about overcoming fear and pessimism with courage and a can-do attitude. And so it's emotionally appropriate that 3PO, the personification of fear and defeatism, is the central character for the first 20 odd minutes. We start the movie with a fear state character. We then meet Luke who is torn between those negative feelings and his own desire for adventure and wanting to make a difference in the grand scheme. And so as mentor characters for Luke, like Ben and Han Solo are introduced, 3PO's role in the narrative is weakened just as the negative emotion of fear is weakened. However, he remains part of the story because self-defeating emotions like fear, anxiety, pessimism and denial are always present in the human condition, even in the minds of the greatest heroes. So-called fearless heroes aren't fearless at all. They're simply better at controlling those negative impulses and reserving them for scenarios in which they actually serve a productive function, such as dodging a fight that you're very unlikely to win and where the stakes are too high. From here on, 3PO is the negative emotional baggage that the heroes of the story have to drag about with them on their adventures across the whole trilogy. Okay, let's continue. Once the group arrive at Moss Eisley Spaceport, 3PO says something that might just be poor scripting, but could be an intended contradiction. After recently cremating dozens of dead Jawas, he says, I can't abide those Jawas, disgusting creatures. Ooh, heartless. In his defence though, Luke shoes away the begging Jawa, and you'd think that he would have some sympathy and give a coin or two given the Jawa slaughter that he'd recently discovered. Sure, that may have been a minor scripting error, but at the same time, 3PO is full of contradictions anyway, and a lot of them are deliberate in how they're scripted, so who knows, maybe his line here was intended to have that contradiction. I suppose at the same time, uh, 3PO might be pissed at the Jawas for having taken him captive and then he had to burn their corpses up. Uh, maybe he's a mix of emotions on the subject. Anyway, on their way into the bar, 3PO is unsympathetic regarding R2's limited ability to ride on sand. Come along, R2. The droids now take a narrative back seat as we meet Han and Chewbacca in the bar. But their ultra lower class status is punctuated. What? Your droids. They'll have to wait outside. We don't want them here. 
Even in a criminal infested place like this, they're not accepted. Then they're seen hiding and once again, when they have a private moment without human observers, 3PO bullies R2-D2. And he still seems to be in denial of the mission importance, even though he's fully heard Leia's message to Ben Kenobi. I would much rather have gone with Master Luke than stay here with you. I don't know what all this trouble is about, but I'm sure it must be your fault. You watch your language. Apparently R2 told him to go fuck himself at the end there. In one of the street shots, we get a glimpse of the lifeless doll-like droid that was in the Jawa truck. Maybe not the exact same one, but a similar model. So again, we have this basic pattern that only the central droid characters come across as living, thinking entities. Other droids in the film are purely mechanical. By the way, look at the funny, unconvincing mask on the alien who buys Luke's, <laughs> Luke's land speeder. Wise choice to film him briefly from far away. I want to see a spin-off movie about that character going on adventures in Luke's vehicle. Okay, that was a little bit off point. On their way to see Han's Millennium Falcon for the first time, there's a rare moment of R2 actually walking down some steps. And 3PO meets Han for the first time, and immediately their relationship is set up. 3PO greets Han and is instantly disliked and ignored. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. The two characters have very little direct interaction in this film, but Han's instant dislike makes sense in terms of what the two characters symbolise. 3PO, as we already know, represents fear, anxiety, submissiveness and other defeatist emotional states, but Han represents the opposite. Courage, self-determination, risk-taking, even recklessness. He's a practical get-the-job-done guy. The 3PO is designed to be a talker and little else, so Han instantly recognises this and refuses to do the one thing 3PO likes to do, which is to engage in diplomatic and often pretentious pleasantries. There's something I really like about this moment is that it plants the seed for the C-3PO versus Han Solo ideological conflict that will be a central factor in Empire Strikes Back and will be a great source of humour. So the action kicks in with a frenetic fight and the adventure blasts off into space, with three of them putting on their seatbelts. 3PO, after being mostly silent in recent scenes, now redeems his role as the verbal expressor of the hero's negative instincts. Oh my, I've forgotten how much I hate space travel. Embedded in 3PO's line there is another trait of organic thinking, the concept of forgetting. Oh my, I've forgotten how much I hate space travel. A computer doesn't forget. After all, he can apparently remember six million forms of communication. And another little verbal pattern there, which I think is the first time he's said this, but it's certainly not the last. He says, oh my. Oh my, I've forgotten how much I hate space. The words oh my are a non-blasphemous cultural shorthand for oh my god. 3PO will use this phrase many times in the trilogy, and here's some examples. Oh my! Oh my! Oh my! Oh my! They'll be captured! Back to the first movie. Now R2 plays chess against Chewbacca. A computer shouldn't be self-motivated in terms of wanting to play chess, and these AI droids ought to be able to kick any organic humanoid's arse in a game of technicality. And as a speaker of six million languages, 3PO ought to be a cognitive super grand master at chess. He isn't playing directly here, but his dialogue indicates that he is on R2's team, and so he should have incredible tactical advice to give. But as usual, he is the cautious one preoccupied with danger. Now be careful, R2. <laughs> this is also a unique moment for 3PO because it's a battle of war in which he wants to take part and is interested in. The difference is that he doesn't sense any immediate physical danger because it's just a game. After R2 wins, 3PO does something quite unusual, having tasted something almost alien to him, victory, even though it was R2 doing the actual moves, 3PO suddenly becomes confident and asserts himself. He made a fair move. Screaming about it can't help you. And he even stands up for android rights, and I think it's the only time he ever does this. Let him have it. It's not wise to upset a Wookiee. But sir, nobody worries about upsetting a droid. Again, the concept of droids being capable of human feelings applies in this film, or at least it does for these two characters. 
and suggest that there is physical danger in the chess battle and this is enough to instantly put 3PO back into submissive mode. That's because a droid don't pull people's arms out of their sockets when they lose. Wookiees are known to do that. I suggest a new strategy, R2. Let the Wookiee win. A good response from R2-D2 here could have been something like, I've got no arms anyway, so you can do the losing 3PO, you're good at that. And I think that would translate as something like, bleep 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 Anyway, right after this chess moment, Luke has some training regarding the Force, and as happened earlier, 3PO has no comment on Jedi training issues. Despite several instances in which there are hints of spirituality in his thinking, the Force seems to be something that 3PO is oblivious to. Perhaps his general negativity is a psychological block on the subject, but then perhaps his robotic framing is the reason for this. And we might return to this question later. Oh, and something else regarding the doppelganger effect. Chess is a form of mind training here, which parallels Luke's training with the Force. Slightly off tangent there. Once the Falcon is captured by the Empire, the four organic characters are seen hiding under the floorboards, but the droids are missing. They must be hidden under different floorboards. But 3PO being absent, or at least silent, fits with a pattern we noted earlier. When organic heroes are voicing their own fears, which even the courageous Han Solo does here, 3PO's role as the expressor of those negative feelings becomes redundant. Actually, the same thing happened in the cockpit scenes when they were escaping Tatooine. Fears were expressed by the human characters, so 3PO didn't need to take part in that scene. How long before you can make the jump to light speed? Take a few moments to get the coordinates from the Nava computer. You kidding? The rate they're gaining? Once the Falcon is pulled onto the Death Star, the group take over a small control room, and 3PO's usefulness as an interpreter finally comes into play, translating for R2-D2. He says he's found the main controls to the power beam that's holding the ship here. They discover that Leia is going to be executed. Luke and Han argue it out about whether to rescue her, and 3PO dialogue isn't needed because Han is expressing doubts of his own. But on the visual level, 3PO is right behind Han in his moments of anxiety, doppelganger style. Only at the end of the scene does 3PO interject. Uh, Master Luke, sir, pardon me for asking, but what should Artu and I do if we're discovered here? Han and Luke mark his anxieties. Lock the door and hope they don't have blasters. Obviously, any troopers who find them will have blasters. And 3PO responds with both sarcasm and an acknowledgement of his very human need for emotional reassurance. That isn't very reassuring. And he plonks a hand on R2 as the only emotional crutch he has left in the room. When the organic heroes get trapped in the cell block, 3PO is very firm in stating the negative, can't do anything about it framing of the situation. I said all systems have been alerted to your presence, sir. The main entrance seems to be the only way in or out. All other information on your level is restricted. But to his credit, when the stormtroopers enter the room, 3PO doesn't take the pessimistic option of surrendering. Either he or R2-D2 devised a simple plan to get the stormtroopers off their backs. But 3PO proactively carries out that plan. They're madmen! They're heading to the prison level! If you hurry, you might catch them! Follow me! Come on, R2, get your third leg out. 3PO could have just surrendered himself and R2 to the stormtroopers, told them that R2 had the Death Star plans, and requested to be given a job by the Empire. But it seems that option didn't even enter his head. There is a severe mistake in the plan here though. He sends these troopers off to the prison level where, to his knowledge, our heroes are still trapped. They're madmen! They're heading to the prison level! If you hurry, you might catch them! Follow me! He could have just sent the troopers off on a wild goose chase to some completely different location on the Death Star. Actually, I think a golden opportunity for a bigger joke here was missed. Wouldn't it have been funny if 3PO had wandered the halls, telling every batch of stormtroopers he came across, hundreds of them, all oh, head to the prison level. Meanwhile, the heroes have killed dozens of the enemy, and yet more keep coming because of 3PO. Uh, that could have been hilarious. So it seems like 3PO is now growing a pair of balls, and he shows what rapid intelligence he's capable of when he's not paralysed by anxiety. He thinks quick on his feet, and confidently delivers an excuse to leave the room. 
All this excitement has overrun the circuits in my counterpart here. If you don't mind, I'd like to take him down to maintenance. All right. So it seems like 3PO is growing in his abilities, just as Luke Skywalker is doing the same during the adventure. But we also get absolute proof in this scene that 3PO is very capable of lying when he needs to. He has told quite a few lies earlier in the film already, but this one is undisguised. And I think this is the only time we ever get to see him grab and pick up an object in his mostly useless fingers. An implication of his limited grip is that it would be near impossible for 3PO to hold a weapon, and therefore he's incapable of physical warfare. I think there's one or two other things he's incapable of in terms of grip. <laughs> anyway, uh, I like the design choice regarding the hands because it gives a certain amount of plausibility to his timid personality. Being defenceless to the point of not even being able to hold a weapon, that doesn't exactly bolster confidence. Uh, he can't even form a fist or throw a punch. However, he is up for a bit of karaoke, but he soon realises he had forgot that he turned off the comlink. Again, a computer doesn't forget, but a human mind does. Use the comlink? Oh my, I forgot, I turned it off. He and Dartu prove themselves to be very useful now by stopping the trash compactor, and it appears that 3PO is mentally and emotionally developing even more. Putting self-interest aside, he is panicking now not for himself, but the fate of his rebel friends. No! Shut them all down! Hurry! He is finally a committed member of the team. And while there's great comedy value in him mistaking their screams of relief as being screams of torturous death, this also shows how he is progressing as a character. He feels deep empathy, and for once he blames himself instead of R2-D2 for the bad outcome. Listen to them, they're dying, R2. Curse my metal body, I wasn't fast enough. It's all my fault, my poor master. Think about this for a moment. Luke and Han being killed would guarantee that 3PO and R2 would never escape the Death Star. But he doesn't complain about this. His primary concern is for his friends, not himself. And another indication of spiritual feelings has slipped into his dialogue here. He says, curse my metal body. They're dying, R2. Curse my metal body. I wasn't fast enough. It's all my fault. This is a great scene for 3PO because he is not only committed to the rebel cause, but he gets a small taste of the guilt and self-loathing that goes with failing to help good friends. He also earns something that has been painfully missing for him throughout the movie, the respect of his friends. We're all right! At this point, 3PO has achieved his primary personal character arc in the story, overcoming fear and committing to a cause greater than himself. It mirrors Luke going on the same journey, and 3PO's symbolic role of personifying the anxieties of human rebel characters will continue for the rest of this film, but in a much reduced capacity. Okay folks, time for a commercial break here. For those of you who are not aware, over at my website, which is collativelearning.com, I've got a ton of videos and articles and audio files on film analysis and psychology and so on, which are available for digital download. And these are items that are mostly not available for free on YouTube or any other platform. You have to order the items one by one according to which ones you want to watch. Uh, and the items which are available to order are, are available on the film analysis page and here which is the insight page and that that page I'll just take you quickly to that that page contains videos and articles and some audio files on psychology there's a ton of psychology stuff there uh, there's stuff on video games uh, there's a couple of items on art such as the HR Giga artwork there's a huge study of his work on there so say you wanted to make some orders and you were interested in the HR Giga one, you click view product and you have a little read up, you check out the price and if you like it, you say I want this and the item jumps up in there into the corner and you can stack items up there in the corner. Uh, let's say you went back to my previous page and you went to the film analysis page and say you wanted uh, the abyss. You click I want this and you can see that the, the items are stacking up there in the corner. So let me just take you through some of the other things we got. I've got a big video on the movie AI Artificial Intelligence, which, as most of you will know, is a Kubrick and Spielberg collaboration, massively underrated film. So I've got a 147-page analysis 
uh, of that film in PDF form, but it's got a whole bunch of supporting videos with it. Uh, got lots of stuff on the Alien films, uh, militarism in the movies of Jim Cameron, two-hour video, stuff on The Exorcist, a two-hour video on Eyes Wide Shut called The Cult of Eyes Wide Shut, and in that one I explore all of the, the various uh, conspiracy interpretations of Eyes Wide Shut, and I assess which ones have got merit and which haven't, and give you my final conclusions on that. Let's see his uh, Full Metal Jackets, you know, tons of Kubrick stuff here, a huge study on uh, Mad Max 2, The Road Warrior, Nightmare on Elm Street, two and a half hour analysis. Predator, two hour, 20 minute analysis. Uh, stuff on Pulp Fiction, Robocop, Risky Business, Saving Private Ryan, Scarface. Lots of stuff on The Shining, Silence of the Lambs, Starship Troopers. Tons of stuff here for you to sink your teeth into. So if you're ever, if you're ever bored with waiting around for me to post new content, because sometimes it takes me a few weeks between projects, then just have it over to the site and place a few orders. And... Once you've picked the items that you want uh, and they've stacked up in the corner there, you click pay and you can select to use your credit card or PayPal. It's all secure. I've been using this selling system for many years now and there's never been a problem with people's personal data being breached or anything like that. And if there's ever a difficulty with the order, you can contact me very easily. There's a short video explaining how to place the orders and a little bit of a write up here about it as well. Okay, so if you're interested in that stuff, then head over to my website, which is collativelearning.com. And now, back to the video. Ben gets killed, and the droids appear to share Luke's sadness for a lost ally. Again, 3PO is less preoccupied with himself for once. Despite his personal development progress, 3PO has an understandable moment of regression during the TIE Fighter battle. Help! I think I'm melting! This is all your fault! <laughs> He's a lot like Oliver Hardy, isn't he, who always blamed Stan Laurel for everything. R2-D2, this is another fine mess you've gotten me into. At the Rebel base, the droids sit in the briefing of how to attack the Death Star. 3PO has no practical role in the rest of the movie, really, but he still has interesting moments. Here's a good one that's easily missed. Luke approaches Han to try and persuade him to take part in the Death Star attack. In the background, 3PO mirrors Luke's actions by approaching and talking to Chewbacca. Is 3PO actually trying to persuade Chewbacca to join the raid as well? There you go, that's that doppelganger symbolism again between uh, Luke Skywalker and 3PO, uh, their mutual journeys. As 3PO sees R2 off on the fighter mission, he has another interesting and multifaceted moment. On surface appearance, he seems to be expressing self-interest again. Hang on tight, R2. You've got to come back. You wouldn't want my life to get boring, would you? However, what I think is happening here is that 3PO has actually gained a sense of humour regarding the topic of danger. He's mocking himself with respect to his previous habits of self-interest, and in doing so, he's using humour to relax R2. And at the same time, he's letting R2 know that he's loved. 3PO has finally achieved emotional intelligence. It's a sweet little moment. During the final battle, 3PO doesn't say anything except... Hang on, R2. Mostly, he just reacts to the computer displays of the ongoing battle. But R2 taking part in the battle is a clever choice in the script because it means that the battle has emotional depth for 3PO. He doesn't want his best friend to die. When R2 dies, 3PO's reaction is conveyed not through words, but through incidental computer sound effects. A falling bleep tone that I guess sounds kind of like a computer crying. I lost R2! The Death Star has cleared the planet. The Star Wars trilogy is fantastic for these kinds of sound effect subtleties. Once the battle is over, 3PO has one final distraught moment, but it's not about himself and he has thoroughly acquired the spirit of self-sacrifice. Oh. oh my, R2, can you hear me? You must repair him. Sir, if any of my circuits or gears will help, I'll gladly donate them. He'll be all right. Now, there's one other aspect I like about this moment. A lot of pilots and droids died during the attack on the Death Star, most of them actually, and they are mourned a little bit during the battle itself, but not in the aftermath, because this is supposed to be a feel-good ending. So we could think of R2's temporary death as a kind of nod to the, the fact that victory in battle brings with it the mourning of the fallen brave. 
In the final scene of the heroes receiving their rewards, the droids are present and they're still important. Luke even gives the now respectable and thus highly polished 3PO a respectful nod right before receiving his medal. 3PO, I mean Luke, gets his medal, but instead of losing control of himself with excitement, his feelings are presented in the reaction of R2-D2, who has been restored to life. And 3PO places a comforting hand on him. For once, 3PO is not the one who can't control his emotions. Very cool actually, loads of human characters here, and a droid is the most emotional. Finishing off the movie, the wide shot of all our heroes together. 3PO in beautiful gold stands out as always, but Luke is now dressed in a golden boy yellow jacket and has a big gold medallion hanging from his chest, just as gold 3PO has that big gangster rap medallion mid-torso as well. I wonder if that visual parallel was deliberate. Probably not, but it's funny. What is certainly deliberate is that all these characters except the short R2-D2 are now standing with their heads at the same height, all equal parts of the team, or even part of each other. The transition to the credits is a circular screen wipe that momentarily puts our attention on the three human characters. After all, the droids and Chewbacca were basically doppelgangers representing emotional aspects of the central three. Okay, so that's the first Star Wars movie all done with, and wow, 3PO has a hell of a journey and he carries a ton of symbolic weight in the story going from bumbling, self-interested coward to responsible and committed to the cause. He's an incredible character. <laughs>